Hello, I'm David Hunt. My guest today is a man that, oh look, I've actually got to start in a particular way. Everybody's doing a brand new dance now. Come on, baby, do the locomotion. Yes, the locomotion, the film clip made famous by Kylie Minogue. This man was part of it as an 18-year-old. Look, I'm going to add a few years to that. David, I actually was 20. Philip Adams is my, my guest, who was in Kylie's Locomotion video. So you're famous around Europe in particular because that hit was so huge in Europe. Well, it was Kylie's first airing. We have to yes. place ourselves back in the 80s, David. So how, how did yeah. you come to be in that video? David, I was a student at the time at the Victorian College of the Arts right. on St Kilda Road. Uh, studying? Studying dance. Dance, yeah. which we'll and get to that, everyone will get to that. Sure, and in that year also was Tanya Lacey, who was in That's the video. Right. Yeah. yes. And the producers of that music video clip came to scout out dancers to be in the video. I just happened to be in the front space <laughs> <laughs> when they were auditioning. And that's really how that and, role and, came and, about. And what, yeah. a, what a lovely story to begin your amazing career. You're a dancer. You, you, know, like you produce so much work now and you come up with so much of the concept choreographing of course you're producing now because you have um you know like of, of course ballet lab was your you know like very famous um company but now you've got temperance hall which is in south melbourne uh, you're doing extraordinary things there um you know like I, I told somebody today that I was doing an interview with you and they went, oh, Philip Adams, you're oh. so well known in, in you know, like the contemporary dance I'm blushing world. now, David. Right. Uh, I know that. So let, let's go back. Let's go back mm. when, when you were a little kid. Mm. Uh, where did you grow up? Well, David, I had a very colourful upbringing. Uh, my parents moved to Papua New Guinea oh. in the mid to late 60s. Why? Yeah. What? Well, at the time, the government was looking to recruit uh, families to move to New Guinea and yep. to set up what was then at the time the Australian relationship to building a government structure with ah. Michael Samari, the Prime Minister at the time. Yeah. And my dad was a graduate from RMIT and he had an economics degree. So there's a conversation to be had. Family unemployed, need job, 1960 <laughs> whatever. We ended up in Papua New Guinea. Gosh, how, um, do you remember it? Um, I have an absolute uh, clear recollection right. of that exotic and tropical paradise to which I was brought up in. Yeah, and it would have been, and it would have been very different to Australia wouldn't it? Well, I didn't know any different, like being a child, but yeah. to to have uh, that very close connection to what was at the time an underdeveloped area, but also that of the cultural society where Port Moresby also was very still much uh, working uh, at the time, uh, as I recall, um, with the idol the, with idolising the Western value to come in and put development and infrastructure into uh, their ecology. Yeah. And so by building a parliament parliamentary system within all of that, you're kind of asking for trouble, mm. but at the same time, you know, connecting culturally where that could have been a possibility yeah. in the 1960s. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah. did you actually, because, you know, like you hear about all the tribal, um, <sighs> did you see any of that? I did. It was probably one of the most uh, unsafe times also to yeah. be in New Guinea whilst they were gaining independence. And uh, I was very present during the rioting, also segregated at the time, uh, where fights would break out between tribes that were between Port Papua and New Guinea, even if it was a football match, etc., <laughs> or a village fighting with another village, yeah. we were immediately shepherded to a zone where we were safe. We were at school and literally the next minute you're in a truck, wow. shipped off down the road to where the police compound uh, had uh, space for the whites living at the time there. Yeah. So did you yeah. see anyone throwing spears? At I did, wow. David. I, I, was, I, I still have those uh, memories, especially at football um, events, etc., in stadiums and on the streets. Wow. Yeah, and also very close to the Catholic school where uh, I was going at the time. You grew up as a Catholic. 
Were you an altar boy at all? <laughs> of course, I was an altar boy. I think it was I would. Uh, I think about my early my Catholic upbringing yeah. as a child as the foundations to which the basis of my art practice is is built today upon. Uh, it was the, my first theatre I attended. Church was the first film that I saw. And I think about all of the uh, symbolism and the congregational experiences of community coming together in the chapel as being, in many ways, um, a motivation for the work that I make today uh, be made into unusual, crazy and bent and um, esoteric conversations that I've always brought Catholicism into mm. um, my my working practice. Now I was an altar boy but I never looked at it as the theatre but so many other people have said there were altar boys or even a few priests that I know they love the theatre of it all mm. but it was wasn't it um, the you know like the the incense and and you know, Latin. We used to say the mass in in Latin. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. And and the parades. You know, because I was linked to a school that was right next door, mm. and we would have you know like on a lady of whatever day. You know, like the the statue would be carried through, and and all the little girls were dressed in their first Holy Communion outfits and throwing rose petals. A, a David, lot. it sounds like my work. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and like you, I remember the response prayer and the hymns and yep. singing together and yep. this motioning as you would walk towards the altar to receive mm. the body of Christ, the blood mm. and body of Christ in the Eucharist. And in pairs, one by one, to then finally, you know, I was the uh, also the... Um, the cloth holder and the chalice holder mm. and the wine class holder to which we also then were served the harvest. Yeah. So yeah, all those events are sort of still part of the makeup to which inspire my work today wow. in some capacity. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. When did you actually start realizing that, hold on, I'm not really attracted to the girl? Was the word gay known very, very much, especially if you were in, in a place like that? No, absolutely not. Well, look, I, we have to jump forward here a little. Uh, I came back to Australia in the mid-70s. Another interesting story before we get to homosexuality in my life. I was in Cyclone Tracy. Christmas Eve, 1974. Whoa. We had moved back to Australia and not too far off Port Moresby, Darwin. Yeah. And uh, phew, luck, not. We ended up uh, being in one of the most uh, cataclysmic in that way. Yeah. And so this tragedy of Australia so, in, that, in that time. And so, so I survived the Cyclone Tracy. So was your house flattened? Everything and... gone. There was my family Whoa. and the friends that we were staying with, two dogs. Uh, we were, I can recall the, the moment, David, standing in the living room. Uh, the wind had gained uh, um, into a momentum where we could almost hear it coming through and seeping through the walls with rain and the entire living room just blew off. It was like a cinematic Whoa. film, um, disaster film moment. My mother threw a blanket over me. This is a very important moment, this blanketing of, of protection uh, that respond also is very relevant to my work later. and ran with me down the corridor whilst the living room is blowing apart and into the bathroom that had been hit by a tree. And then that tree had protected that part of the house uh -huh. and the loo next to it. So uh, there was eight of us in that zone with water rising slowly Whoa. and slowly coming up for eight or more hours and two dogs <laughs> holding above our heads <laughs> while we survived the cyclone. So that tragedy and that moment of kind of- The this, trauma? The trauma yeah. of it. I think about like Catholicism and surviving, you know, these young, young childhood um, moments as, being a part of the process to which my work consistently always has this mm. underpinning of um, death, sex and the afterlife. And we can get to talk about that a little mm. later. But getting uh, back to homosexuality, yes. oh, I think we're I off going. track. Yeah, we landed in Canberra. Okay, so we're gonna place ourselves 19, late 70s. Mm -hmm. yeah, eventually after some time in Brisbane and relatives in Tasmania, you know, quite a lot of um, maneuvering and mobility as a young young person. Uh, and um, at school at Morris Brothers, yeah, in Canberra, mm. 
I remember the first emotion that I felt towards other boys. You know, here I am at an all boys Catholic school in you? Canberra. I'm going to place myself 15, 16 okay. at yep. the time. And then in that moment of realization, sort of from that point onwards, I knew that homosexuality would always sit as an outside conversation of my relationship to the world and others around me. So these sort of early um, experiences of acknowledging homosexuality at the age of 15 in Canberra during the 70s comes with a lot of um, unknowns mm. and improvisation. Mm. And I think it is the, the mindset of the queer in the way that uh, at the time you were saying gay didn't exist, we use the word poofta. Yep. It was pretty much the response to people which that were different. Which was a dirty different. word Yeah, well. which was a dirty yeah. word. Was a very hidden possibility in my body. It mm. hadn't, couldn't emerge mm. uh, until later. It does through other circumstances, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> so, what, when did you realise that dance was going to be your sure. future? Yeah, you know, like what? Did, did it happen at school or was it when oh, I have you... another story for you, David, <laughs> just as kind of kooky as to what we've been discussing so far. We have to trace back to Papua New Guinea. Right. When I was four at preschool, it was on the front of the port of Port Moresby uh -huh. on Ella Beach. I ran out across the road, got out somehow over between a fence and got hit by a car, a sort of a Jeep chuck truck car yeah. and I was okay. I was knocked for a sixer, sixer thank God, because it had a bull bar on the front. I don't remember any of it. I was four. The, the, the worst thing that happened was a slight crack of the femur on the left, on the left leg. Uh -huh. And the physical therapy was so backward at that uh, time that the been. doctor yeah. suggested I take up ballet oh. to strengthen the little bones doing tendu plie and a rond de jean on Saturday morning in a hut on concrete outdoors taught by an English uh, Royal Academy of Dance teacher that, that had come out from the UK to teach dancing at the school that I was attending. Yeah. So here was the first encounter by accident, literally, that I started doing ballet. But how did your father react to that? Because you know, the, the, you know, the butch man, Look, you know, like not a, my son doing ballet. Fine. Yeah, my parents were really open-minded and really liberal in the way that they uh, have had an acceptance of my um, queer, queer mannerism and gesture as a young child. Yeah. Either whether it was dressing up in my mother's outfits and running around the backyard, you know, with the flying foxes and pandanus trees and creating what you call child ballets and choreographies in the garden. It was always a given in my parents, okay. to my parents that the neighbour across the road <laughs> said to my mother over the fence, uh, oh, Kay, which is my mother, oh, I think your son's going to be funny. And at the time I had a pillow stuffed under a nighty to pretend I'm pregnant <laughs> with my mother's wiglet on and a brush <laughs> and grooming my hair and wanting to be filmed on Super 8. So clearly there's this very yep. eccentric child in the wilds of Papua New Guinea. Yeah, but what yeah. about as a 15 year old okay. um, at yeah. the Mars Brothers in yeah. Canberra? Mm. How were you treated then? Well, you're obviously still dancing then. This is a really interesting, you know, I didn't cop it at all. No fact. Wow. It was interesting because I was always that kid yep. who danced and was in the musicals and yep. was a little bit different. Yep. And at the time, that conversation of demoralizing anyone that's homosexual or shows evidence to which they could be different was really shunned at school, you know. But I, I seem to have dodged a bullet there. Fantastic. And it probably was to due, due to my sort of um, willingness to to have no fear and accept that part of me as a young man. Yeah. Uh, but then there's, you know, there's also a lot of anxiety that goes with that at the t at, as much as I'm saying that I was um, just very confident kind of kid. Yeah. Yeah. So moving forward, how did you end up in Melbourne going to I have another story. I'm right. sorry, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm not no, entertaining you in a way that is sort of <laughs> reminiscing so deeply about you know my past. Sit down, you are, David. I was a Channel Nine dancer on the Mike Walsh Show before Whoa. it led the path for me to come to the Victorian College of the Arts to study wow. contemporary dance. I was doing the whole commercial thing. I'd left Year Twelve. Uh, I moved to Sydney. Um, 
I had my, I found my first boyfriend that I lived with and that was a big step mm. in Paddington just down from the Aubrey Hotel. Yeah. And uh, I got a job as a commercial dancer originally uh, and that soon found me a role on the ch in Channel 9 <laughs> Entertainment Industry being a backup dancer for the Mike Wall Show. That's it's awesome. It's a ripper, isn't That's it? That's awesome. <laughs> so a lot of shimmy and one, two, yeah, click back up for yeah. Olivia and Newton and John and Johnny Fardham and these stars, you know. Wow. And here I am, like yeah. 18, 19 years old. So, yeah. yeah. That's incredible, especially mm. considering how you went into the contemporary uh, and you know, like, and pushing the boundaries yeah. of what you do, yeah. how commercially you started yeah. off. Which is very good grounding. It's isn't good it? grounding. I mean, ballet always was part of the syllabus mm. wherever I landed at the local ballet school. Like yep. I attended that heavily, and going into the jazz ballet kind of scene was, and doing a Steadfords also throughout all of these my childhood, leading to the leading to a commercial space in the in uh, late uh, la, uh, early eighties, and then finding myself at the Victorian College of the Arts. Mm. There's enough in that to kind of confuse you, but also know that I found my niche when yes. I arrived in Melbourne in 1985 mm -hmm. and uh, auditioned for the VCA wearing boy proof denim jeans with the rips in it. I had two studded belts, a red mohawk <laughs> and a t-shirt uh, that had so many moth holes in it that I probably, I cannot believe it actually stayed on me at the time and I auditioned in that because I didn't have any tights yeah. <laughs> on the day Fantastic. and that's how I got in so this sort yeah. of rebel young you know teen team auditioning at the time is uh, it was a long time ago you, you went through um, and finished uh, you did finish? You know, yeah, like, yeah, I graduated yeah. with the Bachelor of Dance and yep. uh, I won four scholarships throughout my uh, education at the VCA. Yep. The last one, the most significant at the time, the ANZ were handing out awards within the school through dance, uh, music, mm. theatre yep. and art. And I won the ANZ <clears throat> International Fellowship Award, which was 15,000 bucks back in 1988. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that took me to New York, where I then uh, spent the good part of a decade investing heavily into the downtown denizen of populist contemporary dance scene and art and performance. What was it that made you want to go into contemporary mm -hmm. and not uh, the conventional ballet? What was that turning sure. point? Um, I was, my lecturers at the Victorian College of the Arts at the time, Danceworks was the company. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, I don't. you do remember yeah. Danceworks. And Nanette Hassel, was the artistic director and the disciples of that company are still very relevant also today as influences of the second generation of colonisation of Australian dance mm. as Russell Juma, uh, um, Meryl Tankard, Lee Warren, because this, these very influential choreographers were, were relevant at that time, influenced me and sort of thinking about ballet as a secondary interest at that time, I found myself in a more experimental conversation with my body that was more suitable mm. to my interest and that collision with art also at the time uh, when I arrived in New York was the beginning foundations of the way that then I was to be practicing making and participating in in dance and art together and did you, <coughs> for, you know, were you part of a, a company in yes, New York I was in I probably danced with everybody you could think of <laughs> in New York the the, the catalogue of uh, every single company my first job was um, as a scholarship to Twyla Tharp company, and then it just went through the ranks of okay. Lucinda Childs, Trisha Brown, wow. B.B. Miller, like everybody, Bill wow. T. Jones. Like I had an incredible um, amount of uh, opportunities in New York, and I was that Australian kid <laughs> that, you know, was just part of the community that really became, um, you know, the, the informative of the formative early days of my career. Right. Before, yeah. So what brought you back to Australia? Look, 10 years in the Big Apple, it feels like a good innings, mm. right? And, and um, I, I needed to explore um, my choreographic interests at some point. And given the very lack you know, of support structures in New York, it's like phew, pretty much nothing. There was more opportunity here, I felt, in mm -hmm. Australia, because I, I was coming back infinitum to, to work with a 
few choreographers and to teach at the Victorian College of the Arts. Right. And these opportunities kept be becoming more and more were increasing. So, you know, it's time. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag. Okay. And, you know, oh, wow. that was it. Left a boyfriend behind. <laughs> said goodbye to that. Uh, but also, um, we just if we want to touch on here for a moment, I lived through what was possibly the most horrendous epidemic in New York from 19... Um, 88 through to the late 90s, which was the AIDS crisis. Of so a lot of that um, scarring mm. that I, I held in my body, you know, from the tragedy of losing so many friends. Yep. Did you ever um, fear for you? Yourself? Oh, constantly. Yeah. I think the whole city was in a total. It was in a state of fear mm. at the, of its grip. And how we managed that as a community was was. Um, in incredible really to think mm. about how uh, as artists particularly found space for us to express and be part of what was a very tumultuous time. Mm. I was one of the original members of the Pink Panthers in 1992. We formed in an apartment on 6th Street. Yep. What our job, our role was to protect um, drag queens, gays coming out, queers coming out, lesbians coming out of pubs, trans people, to make sure that they were safe back on the subway and give them a token, token as we did back then, and a coffee from the, from, the, from the deli on the corner and make sure there was safe passage for them home. Now, wow. I was the kind of scrawny little dancer out the back with the 911 girl, they called me, with the, t with the <laughs> quarter to run to the phone and call the cops and all the butch dykes are in front of me and we had t-shirts made up and when we went into pubs on the corner of 6th Street and uh, I can't remember the works and a few other pubs, we were always given free booze. So that was the one... <laughs> Wow. You know, but how so this is like these years are really amazing, yeah. weren't they? To live in the city, to sort of be in that environment where it was very difficult. And doing something for the community yeah, as well, yeah. which was good. Was, so I've got to just take, touch on his. I was so invested mm. of, that, of that decade that I brought this information back right. to Australia. Yep. And at the time, David, I would say there was very little evidence of queer dance, particularly in contemporary dance, in uh, um, had space here to to be explored and this is where I found myself becoming uh, more popular because I brought back an aesthetic clearly of the postmodern backdrop of the dance scene in New York through experimental but I had a queer position a mm. bent mm. inside of that and we could sort of start talking about mm. the early works which were commissioned by festivals etc and then the growth of that towards forming Ballet Lab mm. my company and how wonderfully yeah. successful was that? You must well, be so proud of well, Ballet Lab. Ballet Lab has shared a voice with the queer community since its first, um, f the first work that I created called Amplification. And it premiered at the old AF. Do you remember that on Collins Street upstairs? Mm, which is now a library, I yeah, think. Yes, that's yeah. right. It's a library, the Athenaeum Theatre, AF2. In fact, it was upstairs. And I made this work called Amplification. And it kind of, you know, put the city off kilter. It was a rock show in the way we had not yet seen the uh, graphic imagery in the work and uh, the theme and the subject of that was uh, dealing with the concept of the car accident, um, taking off J.G. Ballard's famous 1972 novel, Crash, oh, yeah, and exploring yeah. that as a physical impact of the body in the space mm -hmm. and how that it pans out into all these episodic ideas of um, of autoeroticism. So um, this then toured the world over and over and over and over again. And it's now in repertoire as a retrospect at the Victorian College of the Arts. The students learn it wow. as sort of part of things. So I think, and then, and then we could get into many years later, like the middle tier of works, which where queer composition started to become more relevant to mm. the work I make today. What I also love about um, a lot of the pieces I've seen of yours is that costumes play a huge part, headdresses play such a huge part, because you're um, a visual artist as well, aren't you? Yes. That's right, yeah, I, I kind of think of myself as choreo-visual, sort of make that up, <laughs> it's a Ooh, little a bit word. academic in its concepts and uh, realisations, but the visual occupation uh, that I obsess or fixate on uh, arise very much 
from nostalgia, like we were talking about my early childhood new, in New Guinea, as much as it invests in ways that movement practice can also choreo-visual an idea together. And it's sometimes in film, mm. painting, and, it, and um, explored in sculpture. Yeah. So, th yes, yeah, so these form, th you could decidedly um, think about the composition of my work as a queer expression of my eccentric and uh, eclecticisms and obsessions come together. And of course, we must add Catholicism that's laid over all of that. The other thing about me is um, I'm a diehard modernist, an enthusiast for mid-century architecture. I'm obsessed with it. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if we look at a th through line of the work, what carries the undertow of the work through many states of of, of experimental form, including at one point hypnotizing dancers in order for them to locate their body in other spaces and psychological zones, wow. not know what they're doing, yeah. and record them while they're hypnotized in order to make the work. So that, like I'm talking, the level of experimentation is, is quite medium specific. All of a sudden you, you call yourself a producer as well. well not all of a sudden, mm. but it's a term that you, you actually said the last time I, I interviewed you, that you're now a producer and you're producing s f within a building which is? The Temperance Hall in South Melbourne. Yes. Where did that idea come from? This, the last three years I've been um, investing heavily in developing a performance space uh, that will support my work but also be an investment for the community to be able to develop and present their own work as much as it is open to hiring as well. Five years ago, when I was still an email, really, I wasn't a space, I was a company as an email. Mm. How did that, how do I like expand that conversation mm. of my organisation to actually be located and have a namesake to it? And I was lucky enough through a tender process that was put forward by Working Heritage Victoria they are also the landlords, uh, caretakers of quite a few cultural spaces in Melbourne of note, including okay. La Mama in the courthouse mm. and Hoyty Hall, and they are amazing, may I say. So it was up for grabs, and uh, I put in an application that, you know, long story short, I was choice artist to occupy the building. And that comes with a lot, a lot of challenge, doesn't it? Yeah. I think about, I've never run a space before. Mm. I've always just had my own you know, company and managed that with a producer on the side. So here, I trans this part of my life is a transitional point where I also become not just the artistic director of a company as the, and or an individual artist, that I look at curation. Mm. And I look at the investment of where I can also support younger artists. You know, I think back when I was also making my first mm -hmm. works and the very little support that came with that or even managing how to write an application to the Australia Council to ask for money or Crady Victoria. My space, uh, Temperance Hall, I'll do a little bit of background about the Temperance Society, formed in 1861 in Australia and they built um, several Victorian buildings of significance spotted around dry suburbs, spattered around dry suburbs and uh, South Melbourne was one of them. Was that a dry suburb? That's right, and Baldwin Whoa. was also a dry suburb. Oh, hold believe. on, there's pubs everywhere in South Melbourne. But at the time in 1861, it, it, was, was, it was not. Okay. Yeah. Oh. We'll have to look back at that evidence, but I'm yeah. pretty sure oh, no, no, it I was a dry you. suburb. I believe yeah. you. Yes. And what was it before you, you took it on? Oh, it's had a, such a colourful history. Before me, it was, um, let's go back even further. Do you know that the, the Sydney Swans formed there? Yes, which I was did. South Melbourne, and they I, were in the I building did. just last week, coming back to have their hundredth year anniversary, yep. and brought some old footy players yep. and come in with some new, you know, the new ones. So, and then it was a a bird life preservation wildlife <laughs> society. Um, there was some denomination denominational um, groups that existed in the building, but most relevant, I think, to um, the community which remember it from the eighties was um, Ant Hill Street Theatre, mm -hmm. the Australian Nouveau Theatre, and the director's name was Jean-Pierre Mignon. And they were cutting edge in their day. I'm mm. talking very, very esoteric 
and uh, culturally rich with experimental theatre. Mm. And a lot of the uh, audiences which attend performances now at Temperance Hall remember coming to the Temperance mm. Hall and seeing what was then Napier Street Theatre. Yep. Really outrageous and cutting edge work. Mm. So uh, that's pretty special. And, and mm. which is a nice uh, segue for you because mm. as what you do That's right, as well. yeah, yeah. Yep. After the, the, um, the Australian Bow Theatre, the hall went into a creative development space and I used to rent it and um, rehearse there and I've made several productions there. So it feels kind of befitting that, mm. a bit greedy of me, but it's sort of like one day I'll own this kind of moment <laughs> or have this Did space. Did you ever think that you would though? Never, no. but I, in the back of my mind, just in the last five years before I became the artistic director of Temperance Hall, I, there was this moment like imagine if or mm. what if, mm. and uh, so there it is, you know, I, I had this. But that's not to say that the hall needed a massive renovation. Working Heritage Victoria invested half a million dollars to bring it up to oh and wow. uh, standards. Yep. And it's today, you know, it's really special. It's mm. something really curious about the architecture, the bricks and mortar, as and, and its combination with supporting really edgy contemporary art that people just fall in love with. Mm. The moment you walk in, it's got this kind of David Lynchian old art house vibe to it, but also um, a curious enough for you to fall in love with the building. Uh, visually, it's beautiful now, isn't it? And oh. and it's because the times have changed and lighting can play such a, mm. and, and especially with con, uh, contemporary mm. dance, is because you don't want a lot of props because That's right. they like, get in the way. That's a really good point, David. Like the young generation, next generation of theatre makers, and performance makers, dance makers, require space. Mm. The proscenium arch idea, or even the seated bleacher arrangement seems kind of foreign to them. They mm. just require space and we're flexible enough at Temperance Hall to support that language. Mm. Um, and uh, we now uh, program within the Melbourne Festival, uh, Dance Massive. Midsummer, we've just finished our yep. latest program, um, which was four, a- Four works. Four works, which yep. was a huge success. Yep. And it just, it actually made me so proud. <laughs> Rainbow proud. But but the, yes. the, the wonderful thing is that I actually interviewed you with some of the- yeah, like, Choreographers, yep. artists, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you were so proud of them. And you were, you know, like excited mm. because they were creating such interesting uh, and developing stuff that takes it to another level, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah, and the the hall was inspiring. The Temperance mm. Hall was inspiring those languages for yep. them. And yep. at the end of it, a quick debrief, they they were enamoured that the space like this exists in Melbourne, where they're not just under the one person directorial um, curation. Mm. They have carte blanche mm. to in the space. Yeah, it's sort of maybe it's the name temperance. Mm. It's like you know, focus mm. and tolerance. No, no, yeah. no. I think it might be the name Philip Adams. Phil, oh well, there's certainly uh, the currency of of, of of taboo and troublesome yeah. and enfant terrible. And, and that's what I love about you. You're, you're on the edge all the time, and you're pushing the boundaries. Mm. And that's what you're doing with Temperance Hall and the the people that you're bringing through on the yeah. journey. Yeah, as we grow as a queer community, mm. we need more space and more voice. And mm. so uh, certainly as a queer palace for those mm. for those artists who want to explore the way I did when I was a younger man. Yeah. I, ha I had very little space to, mm. to carve my identity of homosexuality mm. or how I want to express myself artistically to a mainstream audience, mm. really. And now there is the Temperance Hall. And I can't wait to see what you're going to be doing in the next one year, two years, three years, five years. Philip Adams, it's been an absolute treat talking to you today. And I just want to say, David, also that uh, as a as a journalist and also an advocate and somebody in our queer community and our rainbow community that has served, you know, I'm going to say the good part of two decades, <laughs> yeah, of interviewing people, uh, that we wouldn't be the community we are without you. Oh, thank You've you. You've been Philip. incredible from from the moment that I was first interviewed with you, and you did play the Kylie Minogue, you mm. know, track. And, it, uh, I, and it's it never stops. Comes up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that we. I want to say thank you for oh, supporting our community in the way you. that you're just always there, mm. and it might just be uh, a quick. Facebook, hello, that's how friendly and, and accessible you are to us. And I want to say on behalf of just how I can of our, our queer community that you're just the bee's knees. Thank oh, you, David. Philip Adams, thank you so much. I'm David Hunt and we'll see you again soon.